The H2O Show on BBC Radio Solent. I'm Robin Knox Johnston. This week is Cows Week. I'm in the Solent recording the programme as racing continues all round me. With me this week is Neil Sackley. What a beautiful day. Oh, glorious. It could be better for sailing. Nice bit of wind. Not too much, not too little. Should get some good racing today. Well, we've got a busy programme then today. We have, and, and we're covering an awful lot in cows. I mean, we, we're looking ahead to the Artemis Challenge next Thursday. Hear how the official charity, UKSA, benefits from last year's event. Find out why this is the last year for towing the water. That's very sad. And the cows' cardboard boat race takes place. Plus, Chesil Sailability host a UK championship. And Shelley reports from powerboat P1 in Hull. So she's not with us today. She's escaped to go back to her stink pots. Well, we're guests today on a UKSA rib. Will Miles is the head of sales and marketing for the charity, the official charity of Cows Week this year. Now, Will, last year's events were really quite good for you, I guess, weren't they? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were uh, we tasked ourselves with raising £35,000 to get every year six child in the Isle of Wight out on the water. We had lots of events going on. We had uh, um, gutter boat racing and tri-sailing and, uh, you know, cocktail parties and whatnot to raise that money. And the really positive thing was we actually raised that amount of money and a bit more. And, you know, a year on, we said we did. Um, we said we'd raise it, we did, and we've had 1,123 kids from the Isle of Wight out at UKSA on the water, having an on-the-water experience, which for me, that's pretty special. How long do they get on the water? Uh, they're on the water for half a day, uh, so they come down to us and have a half a day's uh, keel boating or uh, paddle boarding or whatever. Uh, it's just uh, the on-the-water experience kind of depended on the weather a bit, little bit as well as to what we offered them, uh, So, but every year six kid has been out there, and... You know what, for an island, as an island population, clearly I'm not a local for that as well, but as an island population, not everyone gets out onto the water. The stat says only 11% of people on the Isle of Wight get out, but we've increased that quite dramatically. I'm involved in a similar scheme going on in Portsmouth right now. How did you get the word out so you could get these kids to volunteer to come down and take that opportunity of a half day sailing? We went straight to the head teacher and uh, said, bring the year six kids to us. Uh, and the school uh, backed every single uh, group to come with us. And so we arranged it with the school directly and they brought them down to us. And that was looked upon as their days at the sport, was it? Yeah, it's part of their part of their day of sport. It's part of their day of uh, getting together before they go to high school. Because, as I say, year six is a very difficult time in the transition from uh, primary school into secondary school. And this was about part of the uh, team building that they needed to get together with them before they went to high school. How many of those youngsters have come back and said they want to take up sailing? tough one to quantify is that but uh, you know we've had some other schools who have never been to us have come back since as a direct result of that piece so that's really good news we've had about six schools that have come back to us as a direct result of that and that's excellent news and they want to do it again yeah absolutely you know that's great isn't it yeah so all those potentially potential in there there might be a Ben Ainsley perhaps yeah, there could well be. As I say, there was some there was some youngsters who had been their first experience on the water, and you've got to start somewhere. And I'm sure Ben Ainsley started somewhere as well. That's exactly right. So, carrying on with the programme, when do you do your next thousand? youngsters? Uh, well, we're working with our friends at Red Funnel to do our next uh, our next uh, piece for getting the thousands of kids on the island out onto the water. That's a separate piece we're doing, but Cows Week this year is a completely different ask for us. We're looking at our youth development programmes for uh, for this year, getting a, uh, raising £100,000 to get 100 young people through our youth development programmes. Well, we'll find out about how that's going shortly, but uh, this year's regatta is the last for outgoing Director of Sailing, Stuart Quarry as we heard a few weeks ago. I caught up with Stuart earlier. Glad to say that it's uh, second year running was slightly up on last year. Uh, we're just under 800 boats, um, so it, it's a really good number. It is actually, isn't it? I mean, looking out across the water now, um, they're beginning to get ready for racing. And there's a lot of boats out here. I mean, there must be, what, 8,000 people out there? Something like that, somewhere between seven or 8,000. We don't actually make everybody tell us everybody who's on the boat, but, but that, that's a good estimate of, of, of how many are out there, yes. And how many classes racing today? There are 35 classes, um, so 35 different starts on four different start lines. <laughs> the administration of that gives me a headache just thinking about it. 
it's a challenge and it's a wonderful one to have to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with you. Um, but 35 classes, all spotted from where? Um, the race officers, voluntary race officers from all nine clubs uh, who are involved in Cows Week are spotting from, well, yesterday we had three fixed lines and five uh, shortened course lines. Uh, so there are eight separate lines being manned. And it's quite a hard job to, to spot and get and record accurately the sale numbers of so many boats. This is your last year running Cows Week after an awful long time. Do you feel a little bit sad about that? I feel sad. I'm, I'm looking forward to being retired as well, so I can do more sailing. Um, but I'm looking as well, looking forward to my successor and seeing what he, he does and what he or she does and to how they take it, the regatta into the future. Well, it has changed quite a lot in 17 years, hasn't it? Yes, it has. And, and one of the things I hope we've done is we really listen to the competitors the, the, and every, all the stakeholders and uh, try to make it an event that everybody still wants to do. Well, it still holds its place, really, as the world's premier regatta, though, doesn't it? We like to think so. Oh, come on. What competes with it? Uh, there are lots of other regattas that are different, but uh, equally premier, I would say. But, but uh, as it is, I think it's one of the nicest and uh, most fun regattas to do. Now, Stuart, of all these years running this event, what's the one thing you wish you could have done that you didn't manage to achieve? Ooh, that's a really hard one. I mean, you needed to give me warning of that question. Um... I'd like to have sailed during Cow's Week one of those years, I think, but I've just been too busy every year. That's a cop-out, by the way. <laughs> well, it's not a fully cop-out, cop actually, because, uh, you know, just running this event is a huge task, isn't it? But uh, apart from that, any improvement you can think of you wish you'd introduced? Um, I think one of the things that I wanted to bring in right from the word go, uh, techni technical uh, in innovation was then it was it isn't now is to have tracking on all the boats gps tracking uh and it's easy enough to do physically but for 800 boats it's the logistics and the cost is, is just really hard and we haven't quite managed to do that yet maybe next year well you know the way this technology is moving it may not be long before we can do it we can do it even with people uh, individuals mobile phones now and we get most of them but we um, one of the things is with 800 boats you need a very dedicated front end to make it um, visible to spectators and, and even just doing that costs money now as part of your preparation for this year's regatta you went and raced across the atlantic a month ago stuart I did indeed, Robin, and you were there as well. You were slightly faster than us, I have to say. Um, but that just meant I had to do a lot more preparation a bit earlier than I would normally do, so I got ahead of myself. <laughs> so retirement, you're thinking of what? Going and doing a little bit more sailing? How much more? plan is my wife and I have got a little cruising boat, 11 metre cruising boat, and we're going to do cruising on that uh, in nice weather and nice places, uh, but also do some more uh, professional navigating and coaching. You mentioned races there with your little cruising boat, so you're not giving up racing? Oh, absolutely not, no. Well, Stuart, I've sailed in quite a few of the 17 years that you've been running this. It's been great fun. It's been super having you here because it has run really like a Swiss watch. Very good luck with your future career cruising and, I suspect, a little bit of racing tucked in there. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much. That's Stuart Quarry, and I'm sure we'll still be hearing from him in some way in future Cows Weeks. He's going to leave a bit of big hole here, isn't he? It is, because, you know, he's been doing it for 17 years and uh, got a tremendous amount of experience. Very, He's got the right nature for this job. Uh, it'll be very interested to see who replaces him and how, as he says, how they change it, if they change it at all. Well, this is H2O during Cows Week, and we're, at the moment, just off the Royal Yacht Squadron, who are celebrating a very special anniversary this year, as we found out a couple of months ago. We did indeed, 200th anniversary. How many yacht clubs are 200 years old? So it's a very special one for them. And of course they couldn't celebrate their centenary because we were right in the middle of World War I then, so uh, gone for it big time this year. And in fact the pavilion at the moment, it's just l looking s splendid from the water. It does, doesn't it? That pavilion's been a great asset to the squadron because it's enabled to, them to allow more people to come into the squadron, not necessarily members. Um, so I think it's, it's, and of course it's a wonderful place to watch the racing. You sit on that lawn and you just watch the passes coming in close to the beach here and just wait for the bangs because three or four will always go aground on the beach. <laughs>
Um, and then just over slightly east, um, another place that we've done a program this year is the brand new Breakwater, which now is really beginning to take shape. Well, interesting, Neil, isn't it? Because they're starting to armour it. That's put the stone on it, which protects it. It's been sitting there now for, what, a year as it settles down. And now they're putting the stone on it. And, uh, th- I mean, I think this is going to be an enormous asset to Cowes Harbour. It's going to protect it. It's sad it couldn't continue just that little bit further to the east, though. That would have given even more protection to the harbour. It's a pity they weren't able to do that. Well, these waters are known as being uh, challenging at the best of times. Um, but with the addition of this new breakwater, of course, mariners are going to have to learn a whole new uh, tidal flow as well. Yes, I think if it, it had continued a bit more to the east, the tide would have been slightly different. What we're discovering is there is quite a different tidal flow there. And uh, Stuart, the harbour master, has actually put out a notice warning people about it, saying, just watch out for these tides. They have changed because of that. But, you know, we'll all get used to it. But I just think it's such an asset for cows. It should have really been put in 50 years ago, but I think the country was busy with other things at the time. Well, still out on the rib, uh, Will Miles, uh, well, I mean, you told us about this fabulous scheme you're doing for the youngsters who perhaps have never tried boating before, but that doesn't stop you doing what UKSA does as its sort of bread and butter work, does it? No, absolutely. I mean, we work in three core areas. You know, we work in professional training, youth development and schools and groups. So our professional training can go from anybody who wants to start as a, a crew training course with us all the way up to MCA uh, Officer of the Watch qualifications. You know, and schools, we have about six and a half, seven thousand schools uh, from all over the south of England and even uh, we've had some uh, from East Anglia and a little bit further north into Manchester they come through our doors every year and you know they're coming on four and five day trips with us, uh, learning all about uh, um, water sports learning all about yachting and uh, having a real adventure when they're here and you know our youth development courses are making some real changes people who are Unemployed, long-term unemployed, people who are for uh, you know risk of offending or are actually young offenders, or people who are just completely disengaged with school. And these courses that we do, uh, you know, they they give them self-belief, they give them confidence, and they give them that teamwork that only probably sailing can do for people. You know, our one of our directors, uh, one of our directors of uh, youth development, he says, it's not rocket science, we just use the wet stuff to make the difference. And, you know, that, that's just, just everything, it's, it says it right, yeah. It's, it's an excellent piece of work that we do, and we make these people stand taller. I mean, I find it fascinating with the Sail Training Association. We take these kids who are slightly in trouble with the police, just beginning, and you very quickly realise the reason was they were bored. There was, there was plenty of, of, of uh, go in them. It was just misdirected at the moment because there was no alternative. You put them on a boat and they suddenly saw something they could do and were good at. And very important, they got praised for being good at it. Absolutely. I mean, the, 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 uh, we, we have courses, uh, one who's called Unlocking Potential, and that's for people who are at risk of offending or are young offenders, and they just have no direction and no, uh, no focus in their lives. And, you know, we give them focus, and certainly sailing can do that, and it brings, it brings everyone together. You've got to work as a team, because when you're on a yacht, you've got to know what your, uh, what your colleague and what your team is doing, because, you know, you're part of the team, and what you do impacts on everyone else. I think that's rather well put, and I totally agree with you. So how many people do you get through the UKSA in a year? Around about 9,000 people come through our doors every year. Um, As I say, it's a mixture of professional, a mixture of uh, schools and groups and youth development courses. Uh, You know, our base is in cows, and the ask this year during Cows Week is that we're trying to raise £100,000 to put 100 more of these young people through our youth development courses because the changes that it makes to people, the changes it makes to their lives, is just outstanding. And you know what? makes me smile every day when I go to work and see these sort of people uh, coming through our doors and the changes that they, that they make when they walk out. In a moment, we're going to chat with one of UKSA's ambassadors, Sarah Aiton, who probably is very well known in the sailing world. This is H2O. I'm Robin Knox Johnston, and this week the programme is being recorded at Cows Week. I've got the best possible viewing position. I'm sitting out in the UKSA rib, watching all the boats, milling around for the start. Occasionally a gun goes off, and that's another lot sent on the way. And it's a perfect day for sailing. You just could not ask for a nicer day. Absolutely lovely. Well, bittersweet week for a team that have been regular sight here for the last few years. Because by this time next week, toe in the water will be no more. 
Tanya Brookfield, who was co-founder of this wonderful organisation, told me how they started. We've been taking wounded, injured and sick service personnel since the um, Cows Week 2008, so this is a very, very special regatta for us to come where we started, come back to where we started and finish here. And it basically started when I met a physio from Headley Court who was treating the boys at the time. And if you imagine that when we started, there were very little, there were very few organisations who were really taking the risk of taking profoundly injured servicemen and women outside the clinical environment and giving them an opportunity to test themselves um, basically outside sort of hospitals and rehab centres and Holly and I, Holly was a sailor I'd come from a sailing background and Holly and I conceived this madcap idea where we'd take these guys who'd survived the most extraordinary things and we'd put them in, in what's effectively a very high risk um, high adrenaline, high competitive sport and we'd use the sport to help them see beyond their injuries um, everybody thought we were absolutely mad but we had the support very early on of the general who was in charge of um, army medicine who also happened to be a sailor very luckily so he could see the idea behind it and he gave us the, the green light to give it a go and effectively only about six weeks later we brought 14 injured servicemen to cows week and we raced in our first hour event they had two days training and by saturday they were out competing against highly professional crews most of those injured boys had never been on a ferry before let alone a high performance race boat so it really was something quite special i mean that that must be the most remarkable occasion how did these injured sailors react to going on a boat because you know, we've got this ridiculous thing that this is an elite sport, which of course it isn't, uh, but unfortunately it prejudices people. So they're coming down to go and take part in a boat at Cows Week. What was their reaction? Well, it was very entertaining, and it's stories that will stay with me probably for, till the day I die. But um, essentially the boys turned up, most of them, in fact one of the lads is back here with us this year, a young lad called Chris Herberts from Barnsley, and he'll tell you that the only water he'd ever seen had shopping trolleys in it. As I said, half of them had never been on a ferry before, let alone a high-performance race boat, because, of course, what we do isn't adapted in any way. The, the, these are normal high-performance race boats that the boys... The, the quote from the consultants is that they need to come and adapt to the challenge, not have the challenge adapted to them. And so they turned up, and um, two or three of them in particular, young lads with the attitude that um, their sport was football or possibly rugby, and sailing was for officers and toffs, so they really weren't interested in getting on board a boat and we had gave them two days training based out of Gosport before we came here um, and they, they sort of started to warm to us a little bit it was a little bit tougher than they thought it was going to be you know there was no fridge no gin and tonics no loo so it was a bit more challenging than they expected and then they came out racing for the first day and if you can imagine um, the, the, the sort of their expressions when they the boat leaves the Medina and suddenly they're faced with almost a thousand boats on the water they're racing against 50 or 60 other boats in their class um, crewed with fully professional crews or people who've been sailing for years and actually the thing with soldiers they what they lack in experience they make up for in sheer determination and bloody mindedness and if someone tells them to do something then then they absolutely throw themselves into it and um, they had a fantastic time and I think the adrenaline of the racing the way that the community here the sailing community had accepted them very very quickly as one of their own made such an enormous difference and you know, eight seasons later, um, I'm just I'm still bowled over by what we've been able to help them achieve. But I think you've done a wonderful thing because you've helped these people realise that actually there is a life that they can get out and get stuck into. But after eight very successful years, why is it coming to an end? It was with a very clear intention that we would be always be need driven. So um, the needs being the needs of the injured servicemen. So. Um, we, we came. We, we were born at a time where there was an unprecedented number of injured personnel, you know, even more than there were at the end of the Falklands uh, War. And so, we, what we decided was that when that patient population fell below what it was pre-Gulf War One, we would close. And we've we've stuck that. We've reevaluated it over the years. We've been in continual dialogue with the military medical chain. Um, and what we've watched, what we've observed, is other organisations gradually getting more involved. People are much more happy because it's they're more familiar with seeing injured personnel around um, and so people are happy to take more risks and, and actually they realise that these boys will just get stuck into anything and, and to be honest it's far easier to take them out um, high performance yacht racing than it is some novices sometimes who, who might perhaps have paid a lot of money to go out sailing um, because these boys do really get stuck in and um, in, so in consultation with uh, 
military medical chain, that number will be reached at the beginning of next year, providing we're not involved in anything else. And so we took the decision with the trustees at the beginning of this year that this would be our final season and um, this will be our final event. As I said, we wanted to finish where we started and it is very emotional. There's lots of people who would like us to stay or to morph into something else, but actually we think it's the right thing to do to close responsibly um, and hopefully what we'll leave behind is more organisations talking to each other, helping the guys, working together and therefore the need for us no longer being around. Can I just take this opportunity to thank everybody that's given us support because the, the sport of sailing has been phenomenal and it's actually what's made um, the successes that these boys have achieved possible. So just to everybody, to you and to everyone who's helped us, thank you so much and please come and join us on Wednesday night when we celebrate for the last time ever. And that was Tanya Brookfield chatting to me earlier and there's a link to their website on our programme page for today. Go to bbc.co.uk slash Solent. Wednesday's their last day. I know. Very sad, isn't it? That's done so much good. You, you watch the change in those uh, you know, soldiers thinking life is ruined because they've lost a leg or an arm. It's a pretty horrible thing to have to accept. And yet they come out and they suddenly realise, hey, I can go and participate. And the only tragedy I'm still on about, Neil, as you know, is the loss of the disabled Olympics in 2020. And I'm still mad as hell about that. What a great supporter, and in fact an ambassador for Terry the Water was Dee Kafari, of course. Uh, well, yes, indeed. Um, she's an ambassador for the UKSA, but of course she's just back, being a member of the crew of SCA, which did so well as an all-girls crew in the recent Volvo race. Oh, it's great to be home. I'm loving not living out of a bag and actually catching up with friends and family and uh, just reminding myself what it is to live in a house again. <laughs> That doesn't move up and down or side to side. That's right, and the excitement of having my own washing machine at, at my at my disposal is great. But um, no, I've had an amazing nine months sailing around the world with Team SCA. Um, but all good things come to an end, and it is nice being home. And Cow's Week for you, it, it seems like it's a it's a must do week. I'm really fortunate because all my around the worlds are generally over the winter months. I spend a lot of time in summer, chasing summer around the world. Uh, but it's nice to be back in the UK for summer and Cow's Week being that focal point. And you know, I, I've been involved now for the last 15 years. And if I haven't been racing every day, I've been involved on some of the days, if not all of the days. And I know I'm going to catch up with people and friends and guys I haven't seen for a long time, either socially ashore with all the entertainment that's there or on the water on the race course. So it's good fun. We've always been a great Ladies' Day ambassador and, and of course you are the current holder of the Ladies' Day trophy. I know, that was awesome and I was actually really emotional when I won that last year. I remember the award being started in 2006 and Betty Moore winning it and I was on the nominations list and I'd been nominated a number of years, never actually got to win it. So to have my achievements acknowledged by my peers last year and I was part of Team SCA so I had a lot of girls with me there. It was it made quite a big impact and um, I'm really proud to have my name on with those people and I look forward to seeing it grow and continue as well which I think are the plans for this year's Ladies Day on the Tuesday. What makes Cows Week so special? I think this whole thing of sailing isn't an elitist sport. We have young and old on the water, big boats, little boats, fast boats. We have weekend sailors, first time sailors. We have round the world veterans. We have Olympic champions and everyone's on the water doing the same sport and having fun. And I think that whole inclusive thing and the logistics around making that happen are so impressive, but invariably it pulls it off with 8,000 odd competitors and thousands of people shoreside enjoying the sport as well and all these boats and I just think it's a phenomenal inclusive sport and the week exhibits that really well. That's Dee Kafari MBE chatting to Neil earlier. The H2O Show with Sir Robin Knox Johnston on BBC Radio Solent. This week we're recording the show in the Solent on day two of Cars Week 2015 and I've got the best possible position, as I said earlier, I'm sitting out here on a UKSA rib, watching all the boats, milling around, getting ready for their starts. One of the major races that takes place during Cars Week, is, and this time it's the ninth, is the Artemis Challenge, and it's a sprint around the Isle of Wight in aid of charity. Charles Derbyshire told me more a little earlier. So this is uh, probably the most high-profile race uh, of, the, of the week. It's for... Um uh, three different divisions of uh, racing boat. The uh, single-handed uh, Imoka 60s are uh, racing fully crewed here at Cows Week. There's uh, two boats from the just completed the Volvo Ocean Race and four um, pretty extreme looking uh, trimarans that sit between 70 and 80 feet long. And Becky, what's your part in this? 
Um, I'm helping to coordinate the teams and the race um, on the day um, and I've been helping the teams um, sort of with their entries and helping them around cows in the local, the local area. We've got a lot of um, international teams um, from France, um, we've got Dong Fong who are partly the Chinese team that um, competed in the Volvo Ocean Race, so um, just helping them to organise themselves and then organising the logistics on the day of the, of the race. It should be fun. I mean, Charles, you've got an interesting mix of boats there, and of course I suppose most people will be thinking, well, the Volvos will win because they're well worked up and their crews have just been around the world, so they're, they should be ready for this. But actually, the Open 60s can be quite speedy. Uh, yeah, the, the Amoka 60s is really um, an unbelievable class, um, especially when they're sailed with a crew. So normally they're all set up to sail uh, uh, with single-handed sailors. But um, they're using this as an opportunity to, to meet up for the first time. There's, there's half a dozen brand new boats in the fleet that never raced uh, against each other. And they'll be bringing their top sailors so that they can uh, just show off uh, who's got the best, uh, best of the new boats. And any of them got their foils working? I don't know whether they've got them working yet, but um, they've do- many of the new boats have got foils. Um, they don't actually fly like we've seen in the uh, America's Cup class catamarans, but they um, but they they they're kind of assisted to uh, reduce wetted surface area, and um, you know the the first feedback from testing is that they they do work and, and they do the, make the boats go a little bit more quickly in in certain wind strengths and, and wind angles. Um, whether we see a difference around the island uh, will be interesting to see and that's what they'll be looking for as well. Yes, I mean this is what interests me because we're talking about boats that are probably weighing seven or eight tons and the America's Cup boats weigh a ton. So we are talking about a lot more weight you've got to lift up. But will they get less leeway because they can lift themselves up? They'll certainly should be able to stand up a bit straighter, which means their sails will be more powerful. Um, what are you expecting? Um, there's definitely a trade-off. The, the, the class rule means that you can't have um, an optimal set of foils like the uh, America's Cup boats do. Um, so the, the older boats without foils will be uh, looking, you know, it's a year before the Vendée Globe, and they're looking very hard at whether they should be converting to, to foils. I don't think we're going to learn too much from the Artemis Challenge. It's a 60-mile it's a race um, when the, the boats are designed to race for 24,000 miles around the world. So it's 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 a first it's a first outing um there'll be lots of video recording going on and and um and coach boats in ribs to kind of just see what see what they look like uh, before the uh the teams without foils have to make their decision as to whether they convert their boats or not and who have we got coming from britain in this race so um the british uh, the home team is uh you've got a route for hugo boss with alex thompson um great sailor third in the vonda globe last time round um, he's got a brand new boat uh, coming out of the shed any day. He won't be here for the Artemis Challenge, but he's going to race the boat that he came third in the Vendée Globe in. Um, and we've got Artemis Ocean Racing, skipped by Simon Clay. That's the boat that Johnny Melbourne sailed in the 2008 uh, Vendée Globe. Um, then we've got um, a British skipper on the Chinese Volvo Ocean Race boat. And I know um, there'll be a few people rooting for that boat. It's didn't, done very, very well in the Volvo Ocean race against many people's expectations. And um, there's a few Brits on the Team SCA, the uh, girls, uh, Volvo Ocean race boat too. We've also got, in, in the multi class, we've got uh, Ned Collier-Wakefield on Concise 10. It's a Mod 70 trime run. The same class of boat that uh, I think, Robin, you were on board when you broke the record um, a few years ago. I should probably well, get I, that in, into the conversation. Well, I was with Mish Dejoyo, and um, I have to say, I think we beat the other one by about three minutes or something, but when you go from the Needles to Bembridge in one hour precisely, it is sailing. I mean, it just was phenomenal. Great skipper, great crew, but wow, what sailing. Yeah, so that boat is here again, actually. It's not called Foncia anymore. It's not skippered by uh, Michel Dejoyo. It's uh, called Fado 3, Lloyd Thornburg's uh, US-based uh, uh, multi oil campaign. Um, co-skippered by Brian Thompson, um, another well-known name in the shorthanded sailing world and um, a, a brilliant multi oil sailor as well. So we, we can expect a great battle. They're joined on the start line by uh, Musandam Amansail, who um, is again a Mod 70 trime run as well. With the fourth trime run is a, is a grown-up, uh, what was called an Orma 60. It was, was a 60-foot boat. They've lengthened it to 80, but is uh, roughly sim- similar speed to, uh, to the other three boats. So there's going to be an epic battle between those three boats. I think this is going to be worth watching. What time do they start? 
So we're off at 10 o'clock from the squadron line, mm -hmm. just off Cowes. Um, it's not decided yet which way round they're going to go. So um, there's an option. The, the idea is to optimise it for um, for the record. You know, we, we want to see that your record taken, Robin, um, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but uh, it's, it's, a t it's a tough record. It's two hours, 21 minutes. That's, that's an unbelievable speed, as you, as you well know. So they could go off in either direction. Maybe if they're on record pace, they'll be at St. Catharines by 11-ish, and then back at Cowes if they're on record pace sometime around 12.15. Yeah. So, Volvos, Mod 70s, Open 60s. Yep. How are you going to score this lot between them? It's just going to be first over the line or what? Uh, so it's, it's first over the line for the um, Immokka 60 class. The, the, the winner of the Artemis Challenge trophy is the winner of the Immokka 60 class. They're the most numerous um, class we've got here. Um, uh, but there's a charity element to the Artemis Challenge, and there always has been. There's a £10,000 prize purse that goes to the uh, charity of the choice of the winner. Um, so not only, not only is it a great spectacle and a great occasion to welcome all these um, boats to cows, it's actually doing um, a great job for, for the charity of, uh, of choice. And there's a link to the challenge website on our programme page for today. Go to bbc.co.uk slash Solent. And of course, as we heard from Charles, you're the current record holder. Well, only because, I mean, I was highly skilled ballast when we broke the record. You hung off the front and put your arm out so you were first across the line. Well, precisely. I'm not stupid, you <laughs> I got Miss Desio down on the wheel. He can't cut, so I went and got right at the bow. So I'm the fastest person around the Isle of Wight. It's an incredible fleet this year, including, this will be interesting, Ned Collier Wakefield taking his concise 10 around. Now, he's the current round the island race line honours holder so I wonder if he's on a mission to uh, to, to repeat that uh, he may not think he is but I bet you at the 10 minute gun he gets on a mission yeah. it happens to all of us you suddenly warm right we're racing now he'll be out for it H2O on BBC Radio Solent away from cars for a moment Chesil Sedabilita are having their Hansa UK Nationals next week Anya de Jong is from Chesil Sedabilita well, it's really exciting. It's the first time that with the Hansers we'll have been racing on the sea. Um, so we're just keeping our fingers crossed that we're going to have some good weather and some good competition. Well, this is the UK nationals that we're talking about, but you had some great uh, results in the Europeans uh, just recently. Yes, we were really lucky. Um, the, the Chesil Sailability race team went off to, to Rutland for the Europeans um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we had some really good challenging racing and uh, we're really, really pleased with our results and everything we learnt, we learnt out there. So we're just hoping we can put it into practice with the home advantage here at Chesil Sailability. Where are you expecting entries to come from? Um, well, we're expecting people to come um, from all across the, the UK, but we've also had a couple of entries come in from um, Belgium and France as well, which will be very exciting. Um, what are you racing in? Um, so my helm and I and um, Dick and Philip, who are also on the Chesil Sailability race team, um, are going to be sailing the Hansa 303, which is one of three Hansa classes. Um, and it's a, a double-handed boat, um, so it's got a, a jib and a main, so it can get quite wet as well. Yeah, I bet. I, I bet. <laughs> uh, I mean, how do, you, how do you think you're going to do on the back of the European Championships? Well, um, Tim and I managed to be the first British boat um, at the Europeans, um, so we're... We're hoping to do quite well, um, but we're also hoping that the whole of um, the team, team do really, well, really well as well. And of course, for the uh, visiting clubs, win or lose, they get to sail in the Olympic waters just for the weekend. Yeah, exactly. It's something that we probably take a bit for granted for um, Chesil Sailability. But I think for lots of people who normally sail on, on lakes inland, um, coming to, to Portland Harbour and to sail on the, the Paralympic facilities on the sea is going to be yeah quite an experience, I think. Now, Hugh DeLong is the Chair of Trustees for uh, Chesil Sailability. And uh, this is quite a major event, Hugh. This is our really big event in the year, absolutely, yes. Been leading up to it for a long time. What sort of preparations do you have to do? We really just need a big team of volunteers for all the reception, for all the onshore, for all the hoisting, for all the safety on the water and the race management as well. Uh, so it's, it's quite a team to get everybody on the water safely and get them racing. Now, we visited Chesil Sailability at the start of this series and uh, it seems to be a very vibrant club uh, through the summer. Uh, I mean, how's, how's the summer been for you? The summer's been good. We have been thwarted by these very strong winds, which have meant we've lost more sessions than we would like to because we have to operate to very clear safety standards. When we get out, it's been absolutely fantastic. We've had new boats, we've had new sailors coming. Um, but the weather has been a bit of a trial for us. OK, when does it start then, Anya? So racing starts on Friday afternoon. 
and we sell Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Anna de Jong telling Neil about Hanson UK Nationals at Weymouth and Portland next weekend. And of course that is the home of the Andrew Simpson Sailing Foundation who look after Bart's Bash and it's Bart's Bash 2 next month. Yes, it's uh, creeping up on us actually. Well, it's rushing up on us really. I mean, last year was the first time it was tried and it was an incredible success. I don't know how many others got out. I was out there with 150 people on a load of clipper boats and we had a most marvellous race out towards the NAB. But we're hoping this year it's going to be even bigger. And remember, it's not just a UK thing. This is over a 24 hour period. Any yacht club can have an event and get as many people out on the water as possible. So it's not just here, it's all around the world. And we would like to hear from any club thinking of getting involved in this because we'd like to give you a mention. Uh, emails by far the best way to get hold of us. Uh, the H2O show at bbc.co.uk. Latest figures we have, Robin. Uh, 316 venues signed up so far, 45 countries, uh, and there's, only, there's still 41 days to go. That's mar marvellous, isn't it? I, I think we'll beat last year's record, and I think we just get everyone out there doing it. Just, just remind us. And you're doing it? I'm certainly doing it. I wouldn't miss it for worlds. So you'll be out in the Solent. Shelley and I will be at the Weymouth and Portland National Sailing Academy at the headquarters of Bart's Bash. That'll be uh, on the day on Sunday the 20th. Uh, and we do want to hear from as many clubs around the world that, that are taking part as possible. Uh, email us, show at bbc.co.uk. We're guests today on a UKSA rib. And sitting out on this rib just off the castle, uh, the cows just watching all the boats spinning around. In fact, we've been joined by a number of other ribs now. Everyone seems to think this is a good spot. So well done, UA UKSA driver. you put us in the right place. Sitting with me is Sarah Ainton. Now, say to us who Sarah is. Olympic Sarah? Yep, Beijing, Athens, double yeah. gold. Yes, you've done rather well for yourself, haven't you? <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, um, Currently sailing the Extreme 40. I'm currently leading the series, which is good, with the Wave Muscat. Um, and I'm here this week with UKSA, as I'm uh, proud to be an ambassador for the charity. And, uh, it must have been quite interesting, because you were in keelboats in the Olympics, weren't you? Little keelboats. And now you've switched to very, very high-performance catamarans. Yeah, but, you know, as we know, this is why sailing is such a great sport, because it's a bit like riding a bike. Um, we're still trying to get the boat, you know, around the course as quick as we can, sailing the least amount of distance, making the least amount of mistakes. Um, but sure, it's, it's wildly different. The kill boat is a small, dumpy kill boat, very slow. And now we're sailing, you know, extreme 40 catamarans, five crew. I'm the only female on board, so I have to keep the boys in check. Um, 11 races a day or four days. To be honest, some days you don't know which way is up. It's full on and it, it is what it says. It's extreme sailing at its best. I don't think I've ever had racing described so succinctly as you put it just then, <laughs> going round the fastest, etc. That was brilliant. <laughs> but it's absolutely right. I mean, that's what it's all about. So, you're going to do Extreme Forties for a bit. Where's the next one? Um, so, you're off to St. Petersburg um, the week next weekend. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's a really challenging venue, basically sailing on the river, loads of current, not much wind, not much space. Um, you know, you all go around the marks at roughly the same time. Um, very stressful, very friendly. <laughs> Uh, but it, yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a great event and important for us to come out on top of the podium again, as we've only got two more events after that to go. This is taking quite a lot of your time. This extreme forty business. Yeah, the extreme forty, and especially you know, being the only female on board, I have to be physically fit and, uh, and strong because I need to make a difference. Um, so it, at home, I'm in the gym a lot. Um, but you know, it's different. The Olympic sailing, it's completely consuming. If you want to go and win a gold, you have to give it absolutely everything. And for me, with two small children, I just can't be that selfish, ruthless, um, you know, focused person that you need to be to go and win these gold medals. Um, these two little children changed my life. So um, the extreme sailing works really well because um, that works for me. How old are the children? Uh, three and six. Right. Uh, Op is yet? Yep, so we all, um, you might see us in Chichester Harbour, the three of us get in the oppy and, uh, and we go sailing. Yeah, but it's amazing, you know, and that's, you know, my connection with UKSA is, is I'm really passionate about it because for me it's about opportunity and, um, you know, I can give my children the opportunity to go sailing, but it's about creating that opportunity for people that can't. And um, I was lucky, I had the opportunity 
Um, so, you know, if we can generate the awareness, get more support to give those children that chance to get out on the water and, and fall in love with our sport, that, that's what it's about. What are you doing with the UKSA this week? Well, this week we are on a mission. Um, it's our mission to raise this £100,000. Um, so, so I'm here to help do that so that we can deliver more courses um, to kids that are struggling um, and make a difference to their lives. So please come and ha- come to the stand. Um, you can have a go at sailing for £5. Um, there's plenty to do. There's a simulator so the kids can and have a go and see what it feels like. Um, so definitely come down and have a look. And then tomorrow I'm out in the water um, sailing with some of the the children from from the charity and you know we spoke about earlier about it's about confidence self-esteem and you know they'll be in a completely foreign environment tomorrow and it'll be my job to to give them some of the skills they need to embrace that challenge and and again you know walk away feeling um, completely empowered by the experience Sarah thanks so much good luck with it thank you and I hope you're really busy tomorrow I'm gonna be I'm gonna be good girl (laughs) Although the spotlight is very much on the water, there's an equal amount of effort put into the shoreside activities as well. Kate Johnson is Cows Week's commercial and marketing director, and as she told Neil, this is her first Cows Week. I started um, the job at the beginning of April, so obviously that didn't give me much of a run-up, but uh, I think I'm doing all right, and we're all, all set for a fantastic Cows Week 2015. As a rule of thumb, you're responsible for things on dry land, and then... Uh, the sailing director will be responsible for things on the water. That be, would that be fair? I think that's fair to say. Essentially, I'm responsible for the overall strategy of the event, all of the marketing um, and everything that, that happens in terms of putting the event on, while Stuart Quarry, our sailing director, is responsible for organising the racing along with the sailing committee, um, drawing up the sailing instructions um, and uh, organising race management. Now, Stuart's last year this year. Um, any news on, on his successor? We haven't announced Stuart's successor yet. We'll be very sad to say goodbye to Stuart, who retires after this year's regatta. He's uh, been a a firm guiding hand on the helm of evolving the regatta over the last 17 years that he's been with us. He's retiring and going off to do a bit more cruising with his family. Um, He will still be doing some competing around the world, so I'm sure we'll see him back at Cow's Week. I can't imagine he'd be able to stay away completely. But I think his successor will be able to continue the evolution of the event and take it through its next stage in development. Uh, And it's also the last year of Aberdeen's involvement as well. Is is that going to make next year a challenge? We're very grateful to Aberdeen for their support over the last five years um, and we have ongoing conversations with a number of potential partners. So I'm confident that we'll be able to announce a new title sponsor well ahead of the 2016 event. And if you don't, the event will still happen, as we've discovered uh, when Scandia finished. The event still has a life of its own. The event did continue for, I think, two years during the period between Scandia's sponsorship and Aberdeen Asset Management coming on board. We will continue to have Cows Week no matter what, yes. Kate Johnson, Commercial and Marketing Director for Cows Week, chatting to Neil Setley. I'm Robin Knox Johnston. This week, the focus is on cows. There are always plenty of craft to look at during Cars Week, but this year there's something new on the water. It's the new ferry, hoping to fill a gap in the market, travelling to and from the Isle of Wight. Scoot Ferries is running a new route between Cars and the Hamble during Cars Week before its regular service begins in September between Yarmouth and Lymington. The company hopes to add a third route between Cars and Portsmouth. Here's Chris Robinson. To get to and from the Isle of Wight, you have to make a short journey. It's big business with a few well-known names. Now a little one is pushing its way onto the list. And this is it. Scoot, a 12-seater catamaran. She may be small, but Scoot has high hopes when she welcomes her first passengers on board. It'll take 25 minutes to cross between Cowes and Hamble before the service begins in earnest from the 1st of September between Yarmouth and Lymington. These boats are built on the island to a design originally intended to transport workers to offshore wind farms. This is Scoot One, and that's a sign of the company's ambition. While she'll be ploughing a lonely furrow at first, those behind the ferry service are already planning bigger boats and different routes to offer early morning and late evening crossings. We are encouraging people to pre-book as much as possible, so it's much more like travelling with an airline. You know, by all means, turn up on our off-peak routes and we'll try and fit you on, but if you want to guarantee your seat, pre-book. 
To get Scoot on the water has taken a year. £6 million is being invested into the business. More services and destinations offer more choice. As an Isle of Wight resident myself, you know, more, more options and more diversity is going to be better. The biggest issue people have currently is getting to airports such as Southampton Airport um, through any of the ferry services really. Um, and obviously this service is designed to, to meet uh, in conjunction with that and tie up with those, with those flights. Part of the problem is you know, trains and buses don't sort of tie in with the ferries and so you know, that, that should be addressed. I know it's small. I'm sure they'll probably get a lot of punters during Cows Week and, and let, let's hope they make a go of it. Yeah, it would be a good idea anyway. It's more, more transport we got, the better it is. As for the future, Scoot will create at least 30 jobs, another much-needed addition to the economy of the island. Chris Robinson reporting on the introduction of the new Scoot ferry service. You're listening to H2O on BBC Radio Sound, and we're recording at Cows Week. Rakata, where reputations are won and lost on the water. There's always some fierce competition, not least in one of the newer races. Here's Neil. Tony is finally here. Right, the yeah, Neil, boat race, I Tony it, Downs. <laughs> um, what an event. It's brilliant. Second year, OK, and this is absolutely wonderful. And it's for the nominated charity of Cows Week, which is UKSA. And we've had so much help. We've got Goddard's here. We've got White Fibre here who sponsored the event. We've got various private entries. We've got eight, but there should be ten, but we think two are stuck in traffic. It's incredibly no. busy down on the high street I know. At the well, that's why we just delayed the start for 15 minutes, give them a chance to get here. So where did the idea come from originally? Well, originally, I was watching um, on, on YouTube, and I saw the Gibraltar Carball Boat Race, and I thought, right, fun. Protected harbour, a bit different to here. So I had a word with various powers to be, Cows Week, Beth and, and Harbour Master, and they said, yeah, go for it. They wanted to do it. So that's how it's grown, second year. OK, well, we're on the slipway just by the lifeboat station. Yeah. Uh, which way are they going? The course goes from the slipway to a set buoy down towards the pontoon. They go and go around the buoy and come back to the slipway. The aiming of that is because there is a death and destruction race at the end. There's two races of four at the moment. And the idea is they go up, come back, and when they get back to the slipway, we haul them out, tip the water out, and hopefully they'll be OK for the death and destruction while the second race gets underway. <laughs> for people that haven't been able to be here to see this, Tony, where can people see the pictures? We're doing a video, which will be on YouTube, obviously, uh, Facebook, and we have got the big screens being shown at the moment. Uh, they're going to record the race live and put it on the big screen for everyone. Wonderful. The Cow's Cardboard Boat Race. Uh, one of the more serious events of Cow's Week. I think it is absolutely serious, and it's just as important as the Commodores out there. We've got our own Commodore over there, look, you know, all dressed up. Neil Sackley reporting on the Cardboard Boat Race. This is H2O, I'm Robin Knox Johnston at Cars Week. So where's Shelley? Well, hi Robin, I'm in the lovely city of Hull for Powerboat P1 Superstock. Um, and I have got a local team here with me who are a long, long way from home, like I am. It's Team Typhoo. We last spoke to them in Scarborough, believe it or not. So, Team Typhoo, John Donnelly, who is the driver of that team, how's it going? Um, not as good as we hoped. I uh, had a few technical issues in uh, Gosport. Uh, it was a very rough race, um, but we managed to pull out a decent result on the Sunday. Um, done a few mods and repairs and bits and pieces we're back in shape for Hull so hopefully a good result this weekend now um, you're the navigator Kevin yeah. Kevin Hunt why is it so different racing on a river obviously up here we're on the Humber River is it any different to racing in the Solent which you're obviously used to yes yeah, it was really really choppy at the last event and uh, we had a couple of break breakages with the boat which was no repair but the difference is it's, a, it's, a, it's an estuary it's a river so when you're going down towards the bridge upstream you, you're less speed because because the it's a GPS system that gives you the speed and when you turn around you're doing a lot going a lot faster according to GPS so <laughs> that's uh, a good thing <laughs> yeah, well it's a very good thing you know we can, <laughs> it's a lot faster you, well where does the speed come from no it's the tide <laughs> so yeah that's the difference John, a very experienced racer in um, P1 Superstock and many other classes. What do you prefer, racing on a river or racing in the offshore like the Solent? Uh, I think offshore is really my favourite. The rivers can get a little bit um, choppy. You get wind over tide on a river and it, it can just it, it be very painful, um, <laughs> as you well know. And uh, But the, the sea is a little bit more predictable, so uh, I think I prefer the sea, but 
It looks like it's going to be a flat one this time, so it shouldn't be too bad. Well, I've also got Robert Wicks here, who is our Chief Operating Officer for Powerboat P1. Um, Robert, why is Hull so special to us? Well, Shelley, this is the uh, fifth consecutive year that we've been to Hull, which makes it the longest-serving venue on the P1 calendar since we started racing back at the beginning of 2003. So it's a great place to come and race. Um, we know the teams enjoy it. We get great support from a, from a local perspective in terms of the marina. We'd like a little bit more support from the council, and I'm sure that'll come in uh, the next couple of years as they become the, uh, the National City of Culture in 2017. But uh, looking forward to a great weekend and some, some good weather in prospect. Now, when are we back down south? When, when can the local BBC Radio Solent lis listeners come and watch us? Um, well, that'll be Bournemouth, and that's the middle weekend of September, and that'll be the final round. And I have no doubt, given the state of the championship, that it's going to go down to the wire. Um, probably the last race on the last day on that Sunday, on the 14th of uh, September. But before that, we're in Cardiff at the end of August uh, with uh, some more exciting racing to follow for both P1 Superstock and uh, P1 Aquacross. Fantastic. Well, Robert, you're a busy man. You've got to go. Team Typhoon, the crane is here. The boats are going in, so you better go and do some work, boys. Yeah, yeah I think we're we better. All, we're, all, we're, we're all ready. We're done. <laughs> we're chilled. We're chilled. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Good luck, guys. Thank Safe you. racing. Thank you. Well, here we are at the world's leading regatta, and, of course, Sherry has to go off and play with her blinking gas guzzlers. Never mind, Sherry. We'll get you back sailing again soon. Well, thank you to everyone for making this show possible. And if you miss any of our programmes, there are hundreds of clips from the show to listen back to on our website. Just go to bbc.co.uk slash Solent. And let us know if you're doing Bart's Bash, please. We want to hear from you. Next week, we're back here again, speaking to the skippers as they head towards the rock and the fastnet race.